one of the first days that I was in the regiment, I was asked to go into the regimental headquarters. And they had little cutouts of, of chiefs and tanks stuck on the wall. Our regiment was laid from floor to ceiling, 57 objects and tanks and things like that. Then the rest of the 140 feet was the, was the rest of the Third Shock Army, 10,000 pieces of paper. It, it just put it into stark contrast what we had to do. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. Alan Hodges was a British chieftain tank commander in the Royal Tank Regiment in West Germany. Mick Hadfield was his 17-year-old gunner. This is a great conversation between two army mates and the affection between the two is still apparent even today. Mick still calls Alan his army dad. Now Mick met Al in 1987 straight out of his Armoured Corps gunnery training at Catterick. They served for three years together in the 1st Royal Tank Regiment at Hildesheim from August 87 to December 1990. They share detailed insights into the operations of the chieftain, the training, the camaraderie of the crew, as well as important details like, how do you go to the loo in a tank? As part of 1st Royal Tank Regiment, they were at the time the most forward-facing tank unit in the British Army of the Rhine. They were told that if the Soviet 3rd Shock Army crossed the border, each chieftain would have to knock out a minimum of 10 Soviet tanks each, before they got overrun. You can directly help to preserve Cold War history by becoming a financial supporter of the podcast. You'll be part of our community, you'll get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Mick and Al to our Cold War Conversation. Even when I was, you know, quite younger, you know, with all the war films and everything that was around, you know, things like Battle of Britain and The Great Escape and things like that, I, I'd had that sort of thing in my blood. Um, most of my family was sort of minors and not really in the military, and, it, and it's something that stuck with me. When I was sort of 13, 14, I joined the local army cadets, and that was a, a cadets from a regiment called the 1420th King's Hussars, as they were. Um, it was a cavalry regiment, and then even at school, it was just something I'd always wanted to do. And it's the old cliche, Mick's probably heard the same, oh, you know, what was it like driving tanks? Well, I never joined the army or the regiment to, to drive a tank. I always wanted to be the guy who told people what to do, whichever way it was, you know, be the commander or the gunner. Driving just wasn't my thing. So I joined the junior leaders regiment, the Army uh, Royal Army Corps in, 75 uh, after leaving school you do 18 months there doing all your basic training and then joined the royal tank regiment uh, at the end of 76 1977 so to really answer the question it's just something i've always wanted to do and i, and I couldn't give you the exact reason why but it just interested me right from the word go did you not think of any other job or was it always going to be army well to be fair the 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 area at the time where, where I lived, it was basically it's mines or, you know, cotton in factories. Uh, nothing had even come close to it, to be honest. It's just my mindset was that was what I wanted to do. And when I was 16, I remember my mum and my dad dragging me to Manchester to the recruiting office and got my Queen's shilling. And that was me on my way to Dorset two months later. I'd never been to Dorset. Never been farther than London to see family. And uh, there I was, September the 6th, 1975, with a battered old suitcase, Manchester um, Piccadilly train station on my way south. And so were your parents keen on 
this or they they just thought, well, he wants to do it, let's help him? Uh, well, not very keen because obviously at the time we had, you know, the internal troubles in Northern Ireland and other major thing going on. But it's, to be fair, they've always stuck stuck by it. That that's what I wanted to do. So they said, if that's, you know, if that's your course of action, um, so be it. And yeah, they were, they were quite um, pleased and proud, I suppose, when I did the pass off in late 76. And to be totally honest, I don't think my parents would have thought that I could actually achieve anything on that side because I was a bit of a rebel, to be honest, when I was a young man. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Alan. And uh, and Mick, what, what were your reasons for, for joining the army? Uh, very similar, actually. I mean, I had a, a fantastic childhood growing up. I was <laughs> falling off logs and, and doing what, what kids did. I signed up to the, the army cadets. In my case, it was the uh, the Queen's Lancashire Regiment. So I did quite a bit with those. I, I did shooting for the county and triathlon and things like that. Um, but quite a lot of my family were also military. So my uh, one of my uncles uh, served in the army uh, and, and had something to do with uh, bloodhound missiles, anti-aircraft missiles. Uh, and uh, another one of my uncles served on board um, ships and, and nuclear submarines. Uh, so I guess I was destined that way. And, and just like Al was saying, you know, I, I came from East Lancashire from a little village called Huncourt near, near Accrington. Uh, and um, mainly in East Lancashire, it was all about, um, about engineering uh, and, and coal, uh, <laughs> coal mines and things like that. And I, I'd gone through, through school uh, and, and did some engineering at college and decided I didn't want to become an engineer. And I'd always, I'd always had it in my head that I wanted to join the army anyway. It was, a, it was something I was very very passionate about, uh, mainly because I've, I've been in the uh, in the army cadets, uh, and, and then travelled the same route that that Al did basically. So, got on a coach on a train and headed down to Bobbington Junior Leaders Regiment Royal Armoured Corps. In my case, it was uh, in June July uh, of nineteen eighty six. Spent an absolutely amazing year down at, uh, at Junior Leaders. I met some amazing people that have gone on to do some incredible things. Uh, and then made my way up to uh, to Catherine. And your, I mean, Al, your training would have been done down at Lulworth, wouldn't it? Whereas, whereas in my case, uh, we had, we got packed up and sent to to Catterick. Uh, um I learned to do my gunnery at Catterick, taking chunks out the side of the of the Yorkshire hillsides before uh, jumping on a plane and, and going across to um, to Hildesheim. Landed at Hanover, got picked up by a, a grisly old vet who was a corporal. Um, it was probably only 23 or 24 at the time, but I was 17, so everybody else was old. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah, I literally came to the regiment, and one of the first people I met was uh, was Al. Al, what was what was your path like through to meeting up with with Mick? The gunnery side of it was was um, was actually done at junior leaders. It was still in house in in those days. So, as a young sort of sixteen year old kid, you're learning. I suppose the cavalry lads and the and the ones who were going on to chieftain, they were learning the heavy stuff um, with actually within the camp, and we did the gunnery side of it and the radio side of it at uh, at the junior leaders. The driving was mainly done in the regiments, but you did car driving before you left junior leaders, so you did have the chance to drive a car and and then leave at seventeen and a half with a driving license for a car if you were lucky. Um, yeah, as Mick um, was saying, I left in December '76, and my path was jumping on a plane from um, Bryce Norton to Guttersloe. We we all said <laughs> the funny part was we all said our goodbyes at junior leaders, if you like, in the December, and then by the time we went to the airport at, at Bryce Norton, well, everybody I'd left with was getting on a plane, so we were all n- literally nearly filled the plane over to Guttersloe, and then just. Bomb bursted out through different regiments, drop off points, and everything on the on the coach. So when I got to Hereford, the regiment had been there a couple of years. Um, a and C squadron were on Scorpion on seventy six mil, and B squadron were on thirty mil Red and Scimitar. So they were close reconnaissance with the tank regiment. So they they literally had a head start on the rest of us by five or six years of working with with Chieftain. But really, that was my thing up till sort of 79, 80. I went back to junior leaders on the permanent staff there for a couple of years. Met my wife, who was in the Navy, would you believe? She's actually, she was actually a, an air mechanic on Wessex helicopters. But we met at school, but that's another story. 
that sounds like an episode in itself, Al, that one. But, uh, yeah, we'll park that one for today. Yeah, people say, oh, well, no, listen, we, we met at school. But, yeah, that's um, – and then we actually – we spent two years at uh, Junior Leaders, permanent staff. But the regiment then came to Bovington and Lulworth in 82. One squadron, C squadron, went to Cyprus. So we actually stayed in sight for four years. So – a squadron uh, was doing the driving side of it in Bovington. B squadron was in Lulworth, where the tank ranges were. So we had two years there, and that's where we learnt our trade, if you like, crossing over from recce, centre regiment training, to Chieftain in 84. Uh, after exercise line art, the big exercise in August 84, uh, where we actually went to Germany, obviously came back again. People no doubt spoke to you about exercise line art, but mm -hmm. we actually moved over at the end of '84 on Chieftain Mark Fives, which was we, you know, only the old and old people had served on Chieftain before. Uh, we were just getting used to the Mark Fives '84, and then I think when Mick arrived, I might be wrong. I think had we just changed to Mark Eleven Togs. Yeah, we um, when I got there, I think literally the, the, the half the squadron was Mark Fives and the other half was, was Togs. So I literally did my Tog training uh, within two months of being in the regiment. What is a Tog? Yeah, so thermal observation uh, and gunnery system, which was uh, an incredible piece of kit. It, it transformed the, the Chieftain into into a 90s tank. But it, it was absolutely incredible. You could, um, the, you know, the system you could spot. You could see somebody taking a leak at a mile away. Let's put it that way. Um, and you could, you know, a vehicle would, would, would drive off and you would still see the heat signature of the tyres in the ground after it had left. I mean, that was just wow. how good it was. But yeah, absolutely incredible system. Well, wow, because previously the, the aiming was, was it a coaxial machine gun or something, I think, that was? Originally, when it when they first got it, it had a point, it, it had three. It had a point five zero ranging gun, which, you, you know, you see the Audie Murphy films and they use a point three zero. The 5 all was basically a ranging gun. Then you had the 7.62 coax and obviously the 120. So they used to use the, the 0 0.50 Browning as a ranging gun, firing a couple of rounds to get it in the general area. And when it used to strike the target, on the sight and the graphical pattern, there'd be certain points on there. So they would, once it struck on a certain distance, the commander would then know what sort of distance to lay the 120 on. When we suddenly got a system called ISCS, which was Integrated Fire Control System, which then went to a computer. So literally with IFCS, you use a laser, which would fire at the target. Then you come back with the distance. It would lay on a block. And again, even with IFCS and using the muzzle reference system, that took it up to a, another notch. And it wasn't too bad. But once TOGS came aboard with still brew armour on the front because obviously with the sort of to the late 70s, 80s change from T62 to T72-64 that the Russians or the Soviet then were using, they felt that Chieftain obviously with its age would need up armour, which they did, they fit in still brew armour, but also the TOGS, the, the thermal system, which as Mick alluded to, it was a whole new ball game. It was a whole new ball game. You literally didn't matter if it was fog, wet, windy. You could set these things on at 1,800, two kilometres. You'd see them come in. And if you had a preference, the thing with TOGS, it gave you white hot or black hot. So the thermal side of it, some people liked it where the heat signature was in white or the heat signature is in black. And that's why when you look at the police helicopters and that sort of system, it was literally what we were using in the 80s that they now use in the police helicopter. Wow. Now, Alan, what, what was your, your rank and role when Mick turned up? Troop sergeant then of one troop in B Squadron. We had a guy called Taff Thomas, I think it was a staff sergeant. In each squadron, uh, you have three lieutenants, but one troop was always a a ranker, if you like, somebody that had come up through the ranks. One one troop was always somebody who'd come through the ranks and then obviously officers. Um, we had, 
and it was Taft Thomas and uh, full full corporal then was Gaz Walker and Mick joined us. So each troop within a squadron, you would have to work its way backwards a major who would be on one tank and his captain, two IC, would be on normally a, a dozer tank, which is a chieftain with a big bulldozer on the front which basically used to dig us scrapes if we needed them. And then you would have three troops of um, three tanks. So you would have the troop corporal, troop sergeant, troop leader. Uh, but my troop leader was obviously staff sergeant, Taft Thomas. Somebody else would have had a lieutenant. So, yeah, I was a troop sergeant after being troop corporal in there. And then obviously Mick joined us as a young gunner. Troop Corporal normally takes the junior people to train and then they move on. And the troop leader normally has the more experienced people on his tank. So in a tank troop, if you had two corporals, one of them would be tank commanding and the other one would be a full corporal on the troop leader's tank. What did you make of Mick when you first saw him? Well, you know, like you shall lad. Uh, to be fair, most of the regiment... If I could break it down, let's say, for instance, one RTR uh, was mainly northern. So that's how it sort of worked out, Lancashire, Yorkshire, you know, Midlands, that type of thing. Two RTR was normally recruited from the down south, London, eastern side. Western side was three RTR, who we used to call the Armoured Farmers. <laughs> you know, they were from the western side. And Somerset, around that area, four RTR was Scotland. They were north of the border as we call them, the Mad Jocks. So that was the four tank regiments. and and But as a type 57 tank regiment, which we were as a regiment, that's how they were laid out. So you would have, you know, A, B, C and D squadron, HQ squadrons. But each squadron, whether you be A, B, C or D, was laid out exactly the same. Al, can you describe to me what the chieftain consisted of? Basically, Chieftain is a main battle tank. Now, people call tanks when they see anything with a track. Ooh, look, a tank. Well, obviously, it's not a tank because you've got armoured um, personnel carriers and reconnaissance vehicles and like tanks. So, Chieftain is basically a main battle tank of around 60 tonnes that came in um, sort of very, very early 60s because Centurion, its predecessor, was brought out just after the Second World War. So Chieftain is basically the aftermath, if you like, of Centurion. However, where Centurion first started off as petrol and then diesel, it was brought out as the main battle tank, if you like, for the Cold War uh, to take on, which would then have been the T-54, 55, T-62 variants of their tanks. And with Chieftain, its main components, I suppose, is firepower. So you've got firepower, mobility and protection. I suppose they went really for the firepower, the protection and then the mobility because I'm no doubt Mick will tell you more about the L60 uh, engine in it that was yeah, tremendous. But anyway, this was about 60 tonne of tank, which the British Army upgraded through various things, the Mark III, the Mark V, with ranging gun to IFCS, to Togs and still brew armour um, near the very end in the late 90s, uh, sort of mid-80s, late 90s. So it was brought in as our mainstay, if you like, for the British Army uh, to take on the Soviet pact, should it ever happen, that, you know, they, they came to the West rather than staying in the East. So, yeah, or as we would, we would call it, 60 tonnes of rumbling dermatitis. <laughs> And how many crew and what were the individual roles of the crew? So as Mick alluded to before, there is a crew of four, but we were all interchangeable. For instance, I could jump in the going to seat. So to start at the bottom, you would have the driver who was on his own, uh, centrally positioned on, on the tank. He you know, people would say, Well, how can you drive a tank when you're going into battle? Well, he was in he was able to close a hatch and be in the supine position, which is like the fully laid back. He could literally lie back like you would do on a bed and still using his, his side, move the tillers left and right. So you've got the driver down there who basically looked after all the automotive side of it, maintenance and everything. 
on if you look at it from the front of the tank on the right hand side you would have the loader he would be the loader operator he would load the 7.62 uh, gpmg he would load the 120 millimeter main armament he would also be the radio operator so you would have a squadron net uh, regimental net uh, you know see so he was a very busy guy Lower down in the turret, the main bustly part with the what I call the big stick sticks out there, which is the one twenty millimeter barrel. In between, but lower down, the commander's legs would be the gunner. Now, obviously, the gunner, you know, would, would listen to the command from the guy above him. You know, left, right, uh, there's your target. The commander could, in essence, who sits above him, take over from the gunner and actually do the shoot himself. But there's so much going on where he's trying to listen to the radio, he's telling the driver where to go, he's telling the loader what to load, uh, the gunner. So the gunner actually uses on his right hand uh, a thumb controller. It used to be what they call a multiplex system where you could move it left and right, up and down. It went to, I, when it became IFCS, uh, Integrated Fire Control System, it just became a little thumb button. By pulling in the same, the commander could actually override what the gunner's doing. And what I used to do with Mick, God bless him, I used to put him in the general area, override over there, Mick, you know, using our own internal commands, not the, you know, the Travis left business that you have to do officially and be over there, Mick. Yeah. Can I just, can I just butt in here? So, so Al used to say to me, bearing in mind that I'm in the depths of the tank and can't see anything, it's all dark. He would go, there's a target over there to the north. And I'm like, where's North? I have no idea where North is when I'm down here. And then he switched the target. I remember being on exercise with him once, and he went, the target is literally 200 metres that way and swung the gun over to the right. And I still couldn't see it, simply because I'm looking through a times 10 magnification sight. Uh, and obviously, I'm staring at the leaves on a tree. Uh, so there, there were some some amusing instances there. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Al would swing the would swing the barrel roughly onto the target, and then that, that's where um, I would take over and, and engage the target. There was actually, um, we, I could probably still do it to this day. So, you know, the whole command sequence from identifying a target to, to its, its destruction was, was something quite quite fluid that we were really quite good at. And and Mick, what, what were your first impressions? They drop you off and say, go and report over there or something like that. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I went to see the um, the, the squadron sergeant major, and and he he, t- he he said he said two things to me in the office, which I've, I've never forgotten. Uh, and, and the first one was, uh, "Have you heard the expression swearing like a trooper?" Uh, and I said, "Yes." He says, "Well, you are a trooper now. Don't swear when you get to the tank park because when you do swear, it will actually mean something, which which is a real statement." Uh, and then the second one was. Um, a rank is something you were, but respects you have to earn. And I have never forgotten that through my whole life. And that was Ken Parkey. Uh, and then I was taken down to the uh, uh, the tank park and I marched into our, the little shed where everybody was having the, the, their lunches. Uh, and, and Al sent somebody out to get me a lunch because obviously I was a skinny looking 17 year old, which I didn't want to eat. Uh, but Al insisted that I ate the food because he must have thought I was nervous or something, but I wasn't. Uh, and then he welcomed me to the troop. Um, and, and yeah, it introduced me to everybody, uh, in, in the troop. And that was my, that was my first five minutes of, of meeting Al. And then he told me, obviously I was, I was going to be his gunner. Not sure what that entailed at the time. Al, as far as, you know, the, you, you mentioned a little bit there about, about the training, but how is that done? For Chieftain, you had two different types of simulator. You had basically, which was like a Chieftain turret which was cut down so the loader practiced his techniques if you like for loading whether it be you know the big shells loading the gympy gpmg we call it a gympy so 7.62 gpmg in the slang of most squaddies they call it a gympy so uh, and the coax obviously 7.62 is coaxially mounted alongside the 120 so 7.62 7.62 was mainly a, a different technique, obviously, to loading the 120, but this would take place in a simulator in a big hangar. And he would then be taught by gunnery instructors uh, from, from each squadron. Normally within his own troop, he would have at least one gunnery instructor. 
Um, so he would be taught the technique of loading the GPMG, the 120. And then also in there in the sim, we basically had a massive screen. Um, you can imagine a 40 foot by 30 foot silver screen with moving targets on. And you just literally sat in the gunner seat, in the commander seat. The guy would be behind this big, huge table. I mean, it's no, you could probably do do know what we did then, probably with a laptop. But this thing was like 10 feet by three feet wide with, and you just literally practiced the whole regiment would go through, but you'd have slots in there. So you normally when you're coming up to ranges, it gets more intense. You would do it all the way through the year, but mainly on the exercise side of it, you'd be out in the bondu. But while you're in the in the camp, you would be training and training on this this simulator. And then you would also do full crew. So you'd have the loader in there with the commander and the gunner. So you would literally be dry running through what you would do when you went to do the live firing up at Holder. So by the time you'd spent two or three weeks intense training on this simulator, once you got to live firing, the only difference is, I suppose, to be fair, I mean, the gun used to recoil, you know, so you'd have the recoil of the gun. The only difference you would have is the noise from the radios, the cordite in the turret, and stinging eyes. So, Mick, how did you how did you find that training? I, I'd done the training up at Catrick in in very similar simulators run by fourteen twentieth, and then came to uh, came to the regiment to identical training simulators. Uh, in our squadron, Al, you were the gunner instructor, if I remember rightly. Is that right, Al? You were the gunner instructor, yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Well, we used to train relentlessly, uh, and from my point of view, in in uh, in the gunner seats, um, it, it was a real eye opener. Uh, and particularly when you're staring at a screen, which well, it was a screen. You know, it was one of a twenty five foot by by twenty foot, and we we just used to drill relentlessly and, and make your mistakes in there as well. But also, we we'll get the opportunity to take other seats as well. So, you know, when the next gunner would climb in, I would climb into the loader side and I would start to learn from scratch how, how to load. Um, and, and we would multi, multi, uh, multi-skill. Uh, and I think that's one of, the, one of the key things is once you get to a certain stage in any armoured vehicle, you pretty much know everybody else's job. And, that, and that's, that's the route in the regiment for, for going up. So not only did I learn how to, how to gun the tank, um, but I also learned how to, how to load it as well. So, yeah, it was intense. Good fun, though. I mean, we sort of alluded to a little there about the engine. Now, I know there was the um, infamous British Leyland, which was hardly renowned for uh, mechanical excellence in in the UK, and they supplied the engines. I think what the problem was originally when they brought it out, I mean, you know, before my time, was the fact it was a multi fuel engine that they were looking at at the time. So this thing was built to run on diesel, petrol, or anything they could get get to put in it, but it was literally so much underpowered for a beast of that size that, you know, we used to have, I mean, I used to, we used to joke with, I mean, myself and Mick sometimes when the L60 used to let go, we had our own smoke screen. You know, we, we didn't mean to lay a smoke screen, but we were laying a smoke screen because the engine had gone. As soon as the linings go, you just literally got white smoke all over the place. But yeah, it was upgraded. It was upgraded to different variants to the end and in 94 when again first royal tank regiment was the last one ever to serve on chieftain in tidworth in 94 um it, it was quite a decent engine at the, at the end but they did used to say that you know the chieftain tank was the the best tank in the world if it broke down in a good fire position <laughs> which sort of summed it up yeah because i presume clouds of white smoke is not exactly uh, a good way of concealing your your movement no, but when it, when you first started up in the morning, if you get if you get a, a squadron of twelve chieftains, we used to lay our own smoke screen and nobody knowing in which direction you were going then and when it was cold start. So, yeah, they knew you were there, uh, just not where you were. <laughs> well, w- one of the tricks used to be, Ian, to be fair, is you just leave the engine la- idling for a while, and then if you boot it, you'd get the white smoke, and then you just reverse, and so you, it was like laying a smoke screen, you know, in a fire position. You just leave it idling do what you need to do and then tell the driver to put his foot down 
and the white smoke would appear anyway because it had been idling for so long, and then you'd reverse out your fire position and disappear quickly. Now, with the with the TOG system, did that mean that you could fire on the move, or could you fire on the move even previously? Yeah, we 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 could well we could fire on the move. I mean, the the IFCS um, system enabled you to be able to do that, um, and you you could work your way up or work your way down through the system. So um, we had a we called it steam gunnery, which is basically the way they used to fire the tanks in World War Two. So you, you'd look through the through the tank site, uh, and you would see the graticules like you would see in a, in, a, in a war movie. But you'd have the advantage of a of a laser rangefinder um, as well. Uh, and then obviously, you, when you use the uh, the laser and, and the auto laser, it, it had the ability to be able to uh, project an ellipse or an egg shape. I think it was a green egg shape around the target. And an auto lay button, so you push the auto lay, and it will, it will place the gun exactly where you need it to be. You'll pull the trigger and hit the target first time, most times. Uh, and then another layer on top of that was the thermal observation gunnery system, which again was, was just incredible. Um, and you could use that in, in day or night in, 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 in both modes, but that was linked to um, linked to the to the laser system as well. And I, to be honest with you, towards towards the end, um, and our, we, we tended to use the the tog system all the time if we could uh, even in daytime mm. it was that good do you know how that compared to what the soviets had at the time massive massive improvement to what they had you know they they on the move they they were literally to get a good hit they would have to practically stop they they the, the t72 and 64 had nothing really that compare could compare to ours because the 120 and, and, and if you like the turret and then mounted on the main frame, it was quite noisy, quite shaky. But because the main armament is, is on a gimbal system, literally, no matter how much the tank was going up and down, the gun would just stay level on the target. Now, obviously, the suspension was only a bar torsion type suspension, whereas on Challenger 1, when they went to Hydrogas, I mean, you could imagine the speed they could get up to, like Leopard 2, you know, you're pinpointed. And, it, you know, it, it was a very, very accurate system using IFCS. But when TOGS came along, it was just so much better. Different ball game by the sound of it. I mean, did did you know at the time you had something better than the Soviets or was that something you discovered later? No, no, we, we I mean, Mick, Mick can allude to it as well. When we're talking about training, we spent hours and hours in training rooms, classrooms, films, you know, you name it. We went through everything. We went through the whole doctrine of what was expected to come our way, if you like, from the East. You know, which practically which regiment, what they were using, you know, who the commanders were, you know, the, the briefing and everything was so good. It was, it was just literally down to numbers for them it, it would literally be the fact that they would overpower us with at the start of the conflict should it have ever happened thank god it didn't it was just sheer numbers it, that's all it would have come down to one of the first days that i was in the regiment i was asked to go into the regimental headquarters and um uh, it was quite a long corridor on the first corridor probably at 100 150 feet maybe and the first time i was there i turned the corner and uh, they had little cutouts of, of chieftain tanks stuck on the wall, that were three, four inches. Um, and our regiment was on the right hand side, was laid from floor to ceiling, um, 57 objects and tanks and things like that. Then the rest of the 140 feet was the, was the rest of the Third Shock Army. Somebody taken the time to literally put 10,000 pieces of paper representing the Third Shock Army. Uh, and and it, it just put it into stark contrast what we had to do. And I was told um, that, you know, we had to take out at least 10. Uh, 10 tanks uh, to even slow them down to be able to, to, to enable the rest of BOAR to get into into position. But that was quite a sobering thought, spending 60, 70 seconds walking down that corridor and staring at Third Shock Army on that wall. It was it was quite something. But we, we alluded to um, um, the TOG system, but the other, the other part to the Chieftain was also the, the Steel Brew Armour. And that was um, obviously that upgraded or increased the weight of the tank, which had mechanical issues. But the reason for that, that bolt on armour uh, was the 125 millimeter fin round from from the Soviets, which was seen to be able to penetrate straight through, dis- destroy chieftains. So that's why the armor were, was on there. I think we always knew that the 
that the Soviets stuff wasn't was nowhere near as good as ours. But as, as some has been alluded to in some of your other podcasts, you know, as quantity has a quality all of its own, apparently. So, I mean, we demonstrated that in World War Two, didn't we? The Germans had far superior um, Tigers, but we had lots and lots of Shermans. We were going to talk about the the firing sequence. You know, what does that sound like? So, from Al spotting something to the 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 target being destroyed. Al, shall we try and do this? Shall we do this with no practice and see whether we can do it? <laughs> shall we ask Ian to be the loader? Yeah, all you would have to show to Ian is once you've in the sequence, jump in any time you want with loaded, and we know then that we can pull that trigger. Okay. But just just to sort of elude what you're saying is the fact that obviously on the sequence, anybody could see what's going on. And believe it or not, me and Mick will do the commander and the gunner side of it. But you would be very, very surprised how many targets the driver would see from his position before we could. Because on the ranges, with these things were big, massive cardboard things that popped up with a puff of smoke. You know, it's surprising how that guy down there can see this happen before before we do. Right. Okay. So, so what we're going to use, Nick Finn? Yeah, go on then. All right. So, we're, sorry, so, so to anybody that's listening, Finn, we will come to on the different types of ammunition we use. What the fire order would be is totally different if you're going to use a, uh, a Finn round or if you're using a Hesh round because it, the, the fire orders will be completely different or if it's coax. But we'll go for Finn. Let's give it a try. Are you ready, Mick? So we're scanning now, Ian. We're having a look around the scene outside. And all of a sudden, this big, huge T-72 pops its head around the corner. Besides shouting rude words, I would go, Fin tank on! On! Loaded. Fire! Lazing. Firing now. Target. Now, hopefully then, that T-72 is in bits. And I would shout, target stop. But by the time we've done that, we've probably seen another one. So that's the sort of basic fire order. The other one would be, you know, coax men on. On? <laughs> Sorry, was I supposed to contribute there? <laughs> Have I been fired from the job already? <laughs> no, no, you because now what you're doing is you're trying to, you're cocking now, if you like. Yeah. And the old films that you see, the 7.62. And then you would shout to me, loaded. Loaded. Fire. Firing now. And then you'd hear all this, ta 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 And then Mick would then be firing little ranging bursts until he hit the target. He would then shout, target. And I would shout, target, go on. And then he would just carry on until the thing just fell to bits. Now, Hesh is completely different because, obviously, if you're going on to the different type of rounds, you're not expected to sort of end it with one round. The difference with Hesh rounds is that it's a little bit like, I call it like a battleship. So you're firing at something like a ship in the water. So if you go over the top and the next one comes down underneath it, then you are expected to hit it with the third round. And that's the sort of techniques that you use. And to be fair, with, with Chieftain and the laser and IFCS and TOGS, we used to take targets on with hash rounds and practice hash rounds three three kilometres away, three and a half kilometres away. And it all depended on the fall of shot, that's all. If you could see where that round fell, you could correct from that. I think it's worth going through um, ammunition types for, for those yeah. who have yeah. you know, not served on tanks. So that there was um, we've alluded to something called hash, which is a high explosive um, squash head. Uh, which hit the target, exploded, and it didn't go through the target, but the shockwave created uh, a scab that would bounce around and mince everybody on on the inside um, of, of the turret. And then the, the other main round that we use, as, as Al's alluded to, is a fin round to give it its proper name is APFSDS, which is a bit of a mouthful. So armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabo, which is basically a depleted uranium tip that moves a mile a second. The ones that we fired never even had a tracer in the back because by the time you pulled the trigger and it had already gone through the target. So, you know, those are the two main types of ammunition. But we also fired smoke as well. And something called a, a DST, a discarding sabo tracer, 
which was you know a train and the training rounds were actually colored blue as well so you you could uh, you could tell and that the, the hesh practice round was called a shush prac which i believe was full of concrete uh, so we used to fire concrete rounds uh, downrange because they were uh, not as expensive as, as firing the uh, the other ammunition, which was always um, painted uh, in black, usually with a, a yellow. Yeah, I think you sent me a photo of you holding one of those, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's probably why I'm bald now for the uranium and, and, and whatnot. But, well, they uh, it. Yeah, it was... <laughs> It was, yeah, it was, um, and you could, you could always tell the difference when firing a fin round to firing a DST round. You know, the the, the charge was significantly more. Um, you know, the the, the, the rock was mm-hmm. significantly more. Yeah, and also because at the end of the barrel, there's a little shroud with a mirror inside of it called a, an MRS, a muzzle reference system. So after you'd fired uh, a few rounds, you had to dip the barrel and you had to realign the sight to the end of the barrel because it was that violent. So you couldn't you couldn't fire rounds all day. You had to uh, um, you had to do that quite often. In fact, if I got the opportunity uh, when we we're on range with that, I would do it after every round if I could do it. Right. So it's effectively, to recalibrate it. Because on, on the Chieftain, the, um, the the tank laser sight was offset to the right, was the barrel's obviously pointing in a straight line, and the, 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 the sight's on the right-hand side. So you'd have a misalignment after a few shots where you could realign it and then you could carry on shooting accurately. What's it like in the turret with all of this going on? Because, you know, presumably got gases being given off by the gun firing and there's lots of noise going on. I mean, it must be... Uh, a potentially confusing environment, but because you've been so well trained, you know exactly what the other person's going to do and how they're going to do it. I guess. Well, well, I'll hit you from the the commanding side of it, and obviously Mick can tell you what's. It's totally different if you like in 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 his position, because he's more compact. He's very isolated down there. It's very narrow where he is. But if you can think of the, the commander. Imagine a war situation where you are trying to map read, you're trying to get to your firing position, you're trying to listen to the squadron radio and listen to what's happening on the command net as well. You're trying to look for targets, guide the driver into the right place, and then should you find a target, it's finding the right ammunition that you're going to use. So you've got quite a lot going on there. Think of the vibration that this thing is giving off. I mean, it literally is shaking. And sometimes when it's really rough, I put it down as to the same sort of thing as, do you remember the guys with those big jackhammers in the road when they used to cut up the the um, tarmac? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what it was like. The vibration is like that from when you start in the morning. If you're in that tank moving for some, I mean, Mick will tell you, we've had, you know, some 12 hours maybe sometimes we've been in that thing. So, yeah, so you, it, it is uh, on a normal sort of day training uh, uh, bad enough, but when you're on the ranges and you're firing all the time, you've got all the cordite coming back at you from, from the inside. I mean, the trick we used to do was turn the NBC pack on, the nuclear biological chemical kit, and, and suck out the fumes if we could to try and give us some fresh air, everything. But yeah, it was it was a, a very violent place, and you know, the drivers concentrating on so he doesn't go down the big potholes. The loader is trying to listen to the radio at the same time as maybe having to load the gun. Mixed down there in the gunner seat, scanning. And, and to be honest, some of the funniest anecdotes you will get is when you say go left. You know, what you, you you're turning the tank left or you're turning the turret left. You know, you've got to say, driver, go left, going to go right. You know, and, and you, we've had many a time where we've clonked a tree or done something where we've just lost track of where you're going. Yeah, I nearly put a barrel through the front windscreen of a Ford Tunner coming off ranges because yeah. um, it basically was turn left and, and I'd literally move the turret left and I couldn't understand what everybody was screaming at, but apparently I nearly took out a four tonner. I didn't uh, in the end. But that, I tell you, that does remind me of an incident that uh, we, we we had on ranges, um, and we were we were asked to fire an awful lot of rounds um, down range. Um, uh, so much so, I, I remember literally having um, rounds sat on, on on my lap, and Al had rounds on his lap, and they were just pyramidal cones in the middle, and we were just firing for. 
Firing for a lot, just firing as many rounds down as we could uh, just to get rid. Uh, and we fired that many rounds down range that the fume extractor got blocked. Uh, and uh, all the cord out, the stuff that should have come out the end of the barrel, started coming back into the turret. Uh, and there was a, a, a fog or a haze of cord out in there. I started feeling sick um, and, and Ginge, the gunner, um, start, was, was in a real bad way uh, to the point where we had to we had to stop the tank and it became quite a, quite a serious incident. So it, I mean, Al could probably tell you a little bit more, but uh, that was that was a real bad time for me. Probably one of the worst times um, at serving in the regiment from a, a point of view of safety. Yeah, the, the problem was because um, we were closed down. We had to close down at the time, and we were firing mainly the, the shush prac and the hess rounds at the end of the exercise. And it was just again the volume of what we were firing. Um, as Mick alluded to, the problem was that the NBC pack wasn't working brilliantly. The fume extractor had packed up, and, and literally. Uh, Mick started feeling sick and then, I, you know, it, it was one of those where you just went dizzy. He tried to get past me. So imagine somebody sat lower than your legs trying to climb over you and I thought, where's he going? The loader had, had collapsed, hadn't he? basically on the left-hand side. So we literally had the emergency situation where I just had to say, you know, no duff, which means it's it's not an exercise, this is happening. And, and even though the we had to flick the hatches open and even though the guns were still loaded, we had to literally bail out dragged the driver from under his seat out through the turret and we managed to haul some out ginge uh, the loader dragged him by his epaulets on top of his denims out and onto the back decks and onto the floor and it, it actually was quite a quite serious problem wasn't it because he ended up in hospital for a while um, and that's how dangerous these things are and yeah dangerous piece of kit you know it's not something you play around with and when they go wrong they go wrong well, you're talking about the complexity of, of what happens within, within a tank turret. If, if anybody visits um, Bobbington Camp, there's actually a plaque on the wall. I took a screenshot of it, and, and it's, it describes um, a tank commander in World War II, but it might as well be a tank commander right now. And it says, I'll just, just go through it here. It says, the reality of fighting in AFVs. The 75mm gun is firing, the 37mm gun is firing, but it's traversed round the wrong way. The browning is jammed. I'm saying driver advance on set A. Uh, and the driver, who can't hear me, is reversing. And as I look over the top of the turret and see 12 enemy tanks 50 yards away from me, somebody hands me a cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality of being in, in the turret of a, of a tank. You were saying that, you know, you, you, you're you buttoned up. It Was that the the standard procedure going into act? You know, you see the World War II movies where the commander's got his head out the out the turret. That wasn't an option on the chieftain. You had to have all the hatches closed or when you went into action or not? No, no. Um, I, I would say to you that 90%, even when you're on ranges and everything, that you know, when you're practising, uh, you are opened up. It, it's only when you're going into, if you like, the battle situation. The reason you need to button up, obviously, is that if you've got artillery and everything firing over your head, yeah, the last thing you want is to have the, the turret hatch open. But, yeah, it... it Believe it or not, in the in the seventies and eighties, you were still what I would call Rommel esque <laughs> of of sat with your shoulders outside the commander's hatch, with your binos, with your binoculars, and your map, and and surveying what goes on. Obviously, you know when technology. I mean, if you look at the Challenger two lads and and what is then going to be the Challenger three, you know they're going to have screens with with the battle laid out in front of them on screens and everything. But certainly. Training on ranges at Hona, mainly our, our, our um, main ranges were at Hona. If you're in Germany or Lulworth and Castle Martin, if you're in England, you, you didn't have to close down unless it was part of the exercise. Batus, yet another place, British Army uh, training unit in Suffield in Canada, which was basically 100 square kilometres of nothingness and golfers. And if you look here, a few water tanks and trees, so you can map read, and you just did. When you got there after practicing what you were doing in Germany or other places, uh, once you got to Suffield in Canada, that was live firing. You had RAF, you had all sorts coming down. So, mm. yeah, you would button down. But to go back to it, 90% of the time, you would be head, shoulders sticking out because you could see more simple as. When you are buttoned up, what can you see? Well, the driver... I mean, Mick can jump in later, but the, the driver has just a small periscope. 
which is which is sufficient for what he needs. So it's just like a, a visor type glass screen that you can see out of. Again, ninety percent of the time, the, the the commander is guiding him in case there's a massive object, but he just basically gives him a point to go to in the distance, head that way. The loader is too busy inside. He has a very very small periscope should he need it, but he he doesn't look out. He's basically all buttoned up, doing the radios, doing whatever. The, the gunner has got his tank laser sight, which you can see out of, basically like you see in the war films, that sort of vision. The commander, however, is sat up in his, in his seat as his own um, independent cupola, which he has these block sights all the way around. So in essence, you've got 360 degrees of sight. They're not brilliant, but you can look out of them and reverse the tank, drive the tank. Main thing is you can fight it. It isn't brilliant for vision, but as long as you can fight the tank, that's what you're there for. And the main problem that we had, Mick will probably tell you as well, we're on exercise, is that sometimes when you close down, you have that much kit on the thing that you have to put outside because of the, there's most of the storage is outside the tank. That if you put the cam net or some hessian in the wrong place, ooh, you're in trouble because when you go for a high-speed reverse, if you turn around and you can't see the first thing you know about it is when you clock something. It's not unlike being in a submarine, to be fair. Um, and I do, be- I-, I do believe that um, some of the units are twin to, to submarines as well. But it's, you're stuck down, in, uh, in the t- particularly when you're buttoned down. Um, from a gunner's point of view, um, the only daylight that you can see is through your uh, through the TLS, through the tank laser sight, which, which gives you some sort of vision, I suppose. And then the only other way that you could see would be through the uh, thermal observation gunnery system. Um, however, that's a false picture, so it, it doesn't really give you a sense of, of being outside. Um, so if you're claustrophobic, then um, maybe tanks or submarines isn't for you. Uh, surely you, there was a danger of suffering from motion sickness because you, you haven't got that sense of seeing where you're going and you're bouncing around. Did you not suffer from motion sickness? or I didn't. I didn't suffer from it, and I, I don't know why, because today when I, if I go on a ship, I won't suffer um, seasickness, but when I go onto the land, I will, I don't know, vertigo or something, but I never did suffer from it. No, it's, um, it, it was, yeah, it, it's a fair point, that, Ian, actually. It, it's something that never, I mean, I'm six foot two, you know, the, to be honest, the only thing I suffered with is when my knees trying to keep him in his seat crunched up and... You, people, don't don't get me started on your knees. People don't understand what it's like. You know, you, you literally, if you sat on a chair, on a normal chair, and bent your knees and place your feet on the floor, you know, that's bad enough. But if you try and do that for eight hours and the vibration from the tank going, to be honest, it's more on the bones than it is, is on the sort of sickness side of it. Mm. It's just the vibration. It's just mainly the vibration. Because Al was was so tall, I mean, you you do get um, a seat in the gunner's seat, which is, uh, it just pops down behind you into a hole. But I could never, I could never put that up because Al's knees were were so big. So I spent my whole time lent against um, Al's knees. So I effectively could be twelve hours sat on a on a little green pad, and the only thing to hold my back was uh, was Al's knees. So it was quite cramped. Yeah, I did once go in a, a chieftain turret at the Norfolk Tank Museum. But it was just me in the turret, and so it it did appear quite roomy. But I can't imagine bouncing around in that with another, you know, three guys in there. Well, don't forget, Ian, that you, that you wouldn't have that all the rest of the equipment wouldn't have been in there with you as well. It wouldn't have been bombed up. All the personal equipment, the weapons, and everything else. Yeah, food. Yeah. And to be honest, Ian, m- most of our equipment we try to get inside if we can for it to stay dry. Mm. because the woods, normally when you're on exercise in the woods in northern Germany, you're either, you know, it, it, it could be a red-hot day and then all of a sudden, you know, you used to get these thunderstorms where everything would be drenched and then, uh, you know, on some days when it's cold. So you would try and get inside what you can. But most of the, most of the, the, the tank equipment's on the outside and most mm. of our equipment's on the outside in, in, paper, in plastic bags and everything in case the rest of the kit got wet. But I suppose, really, out of the four, I would have said to you, the loader is probably the best one because he's he's standing up. Unless you're moving the turret around wildly, you can sit on the charge bins, you know, drink tea and watch you struggle trying to map everything else, but he's sat in a nice position. 
but we did get quite innovative in the, in the tour. I mean, it, it may sound a little bit like doom and gloom, but um, we uh, took apart a Sony Walkman and we wired it into the radio. So we, we used to have a battle tape. Um, <laughs> no, we never had a battle what tape. What was it, Ride of the Valkyries you had it on there, right? Uh, we had the 1812 Overture and all sorts of things on when we, we, we had uh, music for the right occasion. But we also, we, could also, we also made toasters as well. So we had a, a BV, boiling vessel for making hot things and uh, inevitably that would get broken at some point and then the element from it would be <laughs> would be made into a toaster and, and you know we did have um, a woman as well the bv britain's secret cold war weapon i i i've always heard the americans and other nations are really envious of that piece of kit but but they did i mean you would be surprised the the best part of having something like that was when Obviously, on exercise, we were always connected to, if you like, what we would call a troop of, of infantry. So you would always have an infantry troop with you. And um, they used to love the fact in the morning that when they used to get up and we'd have the engines running, they'd all jump on the back decks and we'd offer them coffee and toast. And, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a war winner, that thing. It was a yeah. war winner. It's a good way of making sure you did get glow support out of them, I guess. Yeah, well, most of the time, if you were going to Suffield in Canada, you would have the same troop. They would try and keep the same people, um, platoons and everything, connected to your troop. So you would get a close contact with the people you train with. So when you actually went to Canada, you would hopefully still have the same platoon with you. And, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think we went with the Welsh Guards and, uh, oh yeah, they were they were they were a brilliant set of lads, and we got to know them well. And so you you were basically with them five or six weeks, and uh, yeah, we had a good rapport in the end. Were you always using the same tank, or did you have to use different tanks? No, we had our own. We <laughs> yeah. I can still remember the uh, 00 EB37 and 00 EB88. They, they were our, it was our wagon. Yeah, it, it became an extension of yourself, really. Um, As a crew. Yeah, I mean, and you gunned it. You, you, you know, you, you tuned that thing. It was a machine that you tuned, that you tuned to, uh, to fighting, uh, and you knew its nuances, and climbing into somebody else's tank was, felt quite different. Well, that's why I feel really sorry for the guys now who – who basically their tanks, even when they go on ranges or whatever they do, they're in a pool. So, you you know, you just pull out a Challenger 2. It could be from anywhere. The difference with us is that we spent our time on our tank, prepping it, working on it. We knew every single fault. We knew every little nuance that was going to happen with it. And to be fair, as a troop corporal stroke troop sergeant, the only downside is that if you're on an exercise and the troop leader breaks down, the ruling is that he then takes over your vehicle and your crew and you get your personal kit and jump on his tank. I personally used to make sure I was miles away from him and he broke down, <laughs> but he could never get on my tank and steal my tank because whenever you got it back, I could guarantee you it would be an absolute tip. It did become a very, very personal thing. And Al's, as Al's alluded to, we used to move the turret around with um, a, a grip switch, which had a, a tiny little metal nipple on, on, on my tank. I, I knew exactly how, you know, where, where the mortars would take it to and from. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was a very, very personal thing um, you know, to, tune, to tune that tank. Um, even, to the, even to the point where um, on ranges, you know, we'd go through that fin tank on scenario uh, and I used, I would ask Al, um, say, look, by saying the words firing now, I knew that in my head that that vibration would travel down into my thumb and into the nipple and probably would affect the, the, the flight trajectory of a round at, at 1,500 metres. So if I could get away with it, I, I would try not to say the firing now or pull the trigger slightly after because I, I, that, that's how tuned we were to the, some of the machines. You, you mentioned some exercises where you're you're in there for – Eight hours, I think you said, or perhaps even longer. What are the sanitary arrangements in that sort of scenario? It depends on what you're actually doing. If you do do what they call a closed down exercise, which is basically you're not allowed to run the engines, you, you probably do this maybe once in your career as a tanky. There's some exercises where they put you in a wood and you're, you're not allowed to run the engines, you're not allowed to have anything 
externally hot, you put your cam mitts up, you do whatever, and you've literally got to close down, sit in that tank and don't move for 20 hours. And you're in your NBC suit yeah, as well, and you were meant to wear your mask, mm-hmm. um, but it, th- there comes a point where it just 20, becomes unbearable. 20 hours. Yeah, so, so then what would happen is part of the exercise you would get, I don't know, maybe RAF reconnaissance aircraft or Americans or whatever flying over the top to see what sort of heat radius you would give off or any recognition or anything, you know, that they could pick up thermal heat. So you were, you know, literally peeing in cans and stowing it. Or if you needed a number two, you literally drop the barrel to a certain level or raise the barrel to a certain level where you could stand behind the breech and do a number two in a plazy bag and tie it up and just stick it on the floor and leave it. Now, I, I would say to you that as a crew, once you've got people in there, the personal side of it, you got to know everybody. But if you were on exercise and you were on exercise for... 14 days or you're out for 10 days the personal hygiene side of it it didn't matter because you all smelt as bad as one another so literally that's what you had to do now we used to do if you're on exercise normally uh you go and have a you, you, you jump off the tank and have a pee on the road wheels and then get back on if you needed a number two and it wasn't anything going on too much you go on what they call a shovel wrecking which i've no doubt some of your um, speakers and listeners have already know about it. You just literally get your toilet paper and a shovel and disappear in the woods, dig a hole, do what you need to do, fill it in, smack it down with the shovel and then get back on. In Canada, <laughs> you know, there's nothing around you for miles. So you, what we used to do, if you wanted to be very posh, is you used to get the plastic oil cans that you used to deliver it in and put foam on the top and make yourself a toilet and sit, dig a hole, sit the side of the tank and just do it there and read a newspaper. The worst scenario, which I'm, you, know, you can obviously head out, but if you're in the middle of a battle and you need to go, what, what are you going to do? You can't suddenly say, whoa, cease and practice. I personally, many a time, have had to jump out my commander's seat, leg it to the back decks, drop everything, have a number two over the back and just get straight back in and go for it. That's literally what it's like. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. That was <laughs> that. That was great. Well, um, you made it worse. The language could have been worse, but we're trying to keep it obviously um, so you can publish it. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. As I understand it, you knew where you were going to fight. You knew the area. You knew even down to firing positions. If you want to hear the answer to that question, you're going to have to wait for next week's episode where we have another session with Al and Mick. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road if you'd like to help the project just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate the cold war conversation continues in our facebook discussion group just search for cold war conversations in facebook thanks very much for listening and see you next week